the most wonderful time of the year. It's migration time, of course. Aren't you excited to see a larger variety of birds at your feeders? I can't wait. But now let's make sure that you are all set to host such diverse clientele. So black oil sunflower seeds are popular all year around. But if you're not serving hull sunflower seeds just yet, consider adding them. Every spring, we get pine warblers coming to eat hull sunflower seeds at our feeders. Finches, you know, gold finches, purple finches, pine siskins, red poles, come and go. So have a Niger feeder with a Niger seed ready for them. You can actually leave it up all summer long, but when the temperatures start to rise, add feeder fresh to the feeder. This product will keep a Niger seed from drying out. Suet is packed full of nutrients and energy that a lot of migrating birds seek after their long journey. One year we managed to attract Baltimore Orioles and not with oranges, with suet that had fruit in it. It was purely accidental. That was actually before we had our squirrel buster suet, but I certainly uh, ran to the store and got plenty of oranges and we managed to enjoy Baltimore Orioles for weeks after that. Have you ever served cooked, crushed eggshells in a tube feeder? Try it out. This time of the year, birds, especially females, need extra calcium. I call my mini filled with eggshells a calcium station. If you have a nut feeder, you can actually serve more varieties of food in it. Consider adding a fresh grapes, raisins, dried black currants, dried apricots, peanuts, and other nuts. Dried mealworms or dried fly larvae like I have here have a lot of uh, protein. You can actually serve them in a tube feeder or in a tray to attract robins, bluebirds, and even warblers. And finally, water. There are plenty of birds that might not be interested in dining at your restaurant, but they sure will stop by for a drink. Happy spring bird feeding. For the past few weeks, Dr. Bird has been in England helping his daughter Erin and his son-in-law Patrick with the hatching of their new baby bird, Hugo. Well, Erin and Patrick bought a house with a rather small backyard, and now they want to attract as many birds to their backyard as possible. So they're asking David for some advice. You know, England's famous for its small fenced-in backyards that are filled with myriad types of colorful flowers, shrubs, and trees. But it takes a special know-how to make one's yard a mecca for birds. And England also has no shortage of colorful songbirds with some of the best singing voices in the world. Thrushes such as blackbirds and song thrushes and tits like robins and blue tits immediately come to mind. Here's what I would do in a nutshell, I mean eggshell. Because there are whole books and entire websites devoted to this subject, I cannot cover it all in two minutes. So I'm going to respond to your questions in two parts. First, the plants. With limited room for trees, I would go with some combination of a rowanberry, a hawthorn, and or a crabapple. Any one of these trees will provide ample cover, food, shade, and a place to nest without dominating your yard. Make sure you confer with your local nursery to get the varieties that favor the birds. For the smaller shrubs, and I can see that your yard is fenced in, you cannot go wrong with clinging ivy, fragrant honeysuckle, and or holly. Besides creating a place to hide, they provide either very tasty berries at varying times of the year or flowers that attract insects for birds to feed upon. A viburnum bush such as a gelder rose or cotone aster are also bird friendly ground shrubs. As for flowers, sadly England is not home to hummingbirds, but you do get lots of butterflies. For the birds, the idea is to track their favorite insects and some of the best flowers to accomplish that are lavender, sunflowers, bluebells, daffodils, buddleia, and red campion. A backyard with any or all of these features will definitely create the bird mecca you desire. Sometimes plants aren't enough to attract the amazing array of feathered chanteurs that England has to offer. And that's where feeders, bird baths, and bird houses come in. You currently have two squirrel buster feeders, one that can offer a variety of larger seeds, and a peanut feeder, my favorite. I'd recommend that you acquire two more brome bird feeders, one that dispenses niger seed and another that holds suet cakes. That should cover you for just about any kind of backyard songbird frequenting an English neighborhood like yours. And rather than clustering them all together on one post, 
I suggest that you space two double hooked wrought iron poles about 10 feet apart, but definitely at the back end of your yard, 20 feet from your patio windows to minimize bird collisions. I think that your best seed for the larger seed dispenser would be sunflower hearts, which would avoid a lot of seed hall mess in your yard. Avoid general bird seed mixes with cracked corn and millet, otherwise you're gonna be plagued with wood pigeons. Since your feeders are squirrel proof, and we do know that there are plenty of introduced invasive gray squirrels in England today, you can offer suet cakes laced with all sorts of tasty treats, like dried berries and insects, raisins and nuts. A decent bird bath is a necessity. Watching a bird bathe is one of the most therapeutic activities I know of in the world of nature. A cement or iron bath, not too ornate, about two feet across, mounted on a pedestal, and located not too close to the bushes where cats can hide, would be ideal. Finally, besides eating, drinking, sleeping, and bathing, the other activity that birds like is producing babies, just like my daughter and son-in-law. Putting up a birdhouse uh, or two as high as you can from predators like cats and squirrels is the ticket. Tits, house sparrows, starlings, and wrens are your most likely tenants in a small backyard. There are numerous building plans on the internet, but many local garden centers and an organization like the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, commonly known as the RSPB, also sell ready-to-install houses that are durable and waterproof, biologically correct in size, healthy for the birds with no toxic preservatives, and not ornately designed so as to attract predators. Your best bet for information on installing them is found on the RSPB website. So now you've got plants, feeders, baths, and birdhouses, and Bob's your uncle. Ooh, I just love saying that. You know, when I was growing up in the Soviet Union, twice a year, in the fall and in the spring, the whole country would be asked to go outside and clean up. It was a bit tedious for me as a child because we had to do it on our day off, but believe it or not, I carried that habit into my adulthood and I absolutely cannot walk by litter that's lying around on the ground. And then of course in the spring when all the snow melts, somehow there is always so much garbage lying around. So today we're going to pick up as much garbage in our neighborhood as we can, especially in the woods and along our beautiful brook. sparrows a lot of people call them little brown things or brown birds and it's true they do look kind of similar it took me a few years to work out a system to distinguish them so uh, for me song sparrows have a dot on their chest american tree sparrows have bicolored bills the top is dark and the bottom is yellow and then chipping sparrows have this brown cap and nothing really on their chest. But I find that fox sparrows are the easiest sparrows to identify. They're much larger than any other sparrows and their coat is almost red rufous color. They really stand out among the other sparrows. But of course, nothing is easier with these sparrows either. There are 18 subspecies of them and they look slightly different in different areas. Check out pictures that Dan Hutchinson took of fox sparrows on the west coast. He says that for every 50 song sparrows, he sees only one fox sparrow. And these are pictures of fox sparrows here in Quebec. They actually come to our backyard and are happy to clean up under our bird feeders. I'm expecting them any day now because they come here to breed. So in the winter, fox sparrows can be spotted in most states on the east and west coast. And then they move to northern states and here in Canada for their breeding season. Just like many other birds, fox sparrows change their diets with seasons. In the winter, they eat seeds and weeds and berries. And then in the spring and during their breeding season, they switch to insects and bugs. I have yet to see them on my bird feeders because they tend to hang out on the ground under the bird feeders, scratching the ground, lifting leaves and looking for food under all the leaves that we leave behind in the fall. 
The fox sparrow is another bird that benefits from brush piles. They use them for cover. There are tons of insects that hang out there and they can also use them to build their nests. Though fox sparrows work really hard to conceal their nests. Their breeding season is from mid-May until late July, but the whole breeding process is really fast. There is no sitting around and playing around. Pairs form as soon as they arrive at their breeding grounds. Females start building their nests immediately and then they lay eggs right away. Their clutches are two to five eggs. Females incubate and feed the chicks, but hatchlings actually don't waste any time growing up. Some of them leave their nests when they're only 11 days old, though they still cling to their parents for another 10 to 12 days. Well, everyone, it's time to say goodbye. I hope you'll be able to clean up your neighborhood a bit. Let me know what kind of migratory birds you are seeing in your backyard. And our photo contest is still open. It's Birds of the World. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.